Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session. Um, so my name is Rong, uh, and I am a PM on the Visual Studio C++ team at Microsoft. Um, so our team owns everything <coughs> developer tools for C++. So we do own the compiler, MSVC, the libraries, the IDEs, including Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. So uh, myself, I've been focusing on Visual Studio Code for C++ in the past year. Um, so really happy to be here to share with you what we have got in Visual Studio Code for C++ development. Um, so just a quick show of hands, just so I know. Uh, how many of you have already used Visual Studio Code for C++ development? OK. Majority, 60% probably. Hi, welcome. Visual Studio Code. Code, yes. For C++? Uh, yes. OK, good. Uh, All right. Well, mostly for TypeScript, but. OK, but you have used it for C++ yeah. too. OK. Sure. Um, yeah, so for those of you who haven't tried, I will show something um, really simple, easy, and to get you started. And for those of you who have tried, I'm going to show the latest version of Visual Studio uh, Code C++ extension that we just shipped this week, on Tuesday. So everyone is going to see something new that you haven't seen before. Uh, my agenda is really, really simple. We're going to do a quick introduction to Visual Studio Code, and then we're going to spend majority of the time doing demos, um, and we'll do a summary at the end. Um, so first of all, the Visual Studio product family. Um, many of you probably are familiar with some of these products, but there are some other products. We count everything as the uh, Visual Studio product family. There's Visual Studio IDE, which um, is a really uh, rich featured full IDE that has everything, literally everything for, from platform support to functionality, um, from um, testing, <coughs> deployment, debugging, everything they are profiling. And Visual Studio Team Services is our developer services, which helps you to build your code in the cloud. Cloud building, uh, managing your work items, including bugs, continuous integration. It does work with Git as well, so a bunch of services. And Visual Studio Code is our cross-platform lightweight editor that we're going to focus on today. Uh, last but not least, <coughs> Visual Studio App Center, which is another set of developer services that focus on uh, production diagnostics, you can get analytics, you can get crash reports, and stuff like that. So for this talk, we're going to focus on Visual Studio Code. Really, really quick. Um, it's a lightweight editor, but really powerful. It runs cross-platform, uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac. It's completely free and it's open sourced. Um, it has built-in support for JavaScript, TypeScript, and Node.js. But many other languages are also supported through extensions. So there's C++, which is the, the, the one we're going to talk about today. But there's also other languages that's well supported, including C Sharp, Python, um, PHP, Go, and, and many, many other languages through extensions. Completely extensible and customizable. Yes? So just to understand, this is basically just a code editor. Yes, so the question is, this is basically just a code editor. And the answer is yes. Um, it is meant to be a lightweight code editor. But it does have a, a very lightweight basic debugger built in as well, which I'm going to show you in the demos. Um, last but not least, it has a built in Git integration, which I'm going to show. Yes, question? You said it's multi platform. Is it written in Java? Um, the question is you mentioned this is cross platform. Is this editor written in Java? Um, it's not in Java. So this editor itself is based on this technology called Electron. And some of these components uh, of VS Code is actually written in JavaScript. All right. So um, just uh, a quick introduction on the C++ extension for VS Code. Um, this extension, which is what our team focuses on, enables C++, C and C++, IntelliSense, co-browsing, and <coughs> debugging. Um, we shipped it roughly around two years ago. It's got over 7 million downloads uh, to date. So let's switch over to a different machine and start doing demos. So 
Huh? Bad idea. Bad idea to do challenges on stage? <laughs> yes. Bad idea mode. Always go wrong. Yes, I know. See what I set myself up to. But I'm going to do it. Let's. Yes. Is there any reason that the other machine is Mac? Um, no reason, because it runs cross-platform. I thought I might as well show you on two different machines, just so you believe it actually runs on cross-platform. Um, so everything I demo here on Mac, you can pretty much do the same thing on Linux. A uh, very similar experience on Windows, of course, but you just pick Mac for no reason. Uh-oh. All right. And if you don't mind, I'm going to sit down okay, for demos. OK, awesome. All right. Let me get my timer started. And we'll see how long it takes. I said 20 minutes from scratch, right? All right, now it's starting. Um, OK, so here's Visual Studio Code. Um, and I just want to show you one thing before I get started, which is if you switch over to this extension folder um, tab, um, this here is the Microsoft C++ extension for VS Code. That's, the only, that's all we need for everything I do today in demos. All right, so now let's go back. Are the extensions all for free? Yes, completely free. And we also open sourced part <clears throat> of it. And I don't have time for that right now. Okay. Hold on to the questions. We'll get to that once I'm done. Um, OK, so by. Scratch, I really mean that, which means I'm going to create a new folder here. It has nothing in it. I'm going to open that folder in VS Code, CPP now. And it's going to show me a welcome page. I'm going to close that. <coughs> and literally, there's nothing in here. Now, let's add a new file, do a very simple program. Notice, as soon as I type in CPP, it recognizes it's a C++ file, which means our IntelliSense um, for, for uh, C++ is going to start to kick in. Yes. Does it work for CXX as well? CX. Or CXX. Oh, CXX, yes. So we do have a list of uh, file extensions that we associate with this extension. Um, yes. OK, so with no configuration so far, I've simply created a new file. You're going to see we have IntelliSense support right away out of the box. Um, probably include one thing we just added was the auto suggestion, uh, auto complete suggestion for headers. When you type in pound include. So I could do system headers, or I could do user headers by doing quotes. So that's just already there. Now I can type in with the help of IntelliSense all the way. We know what namespaces are available. We give you suggestions, and I can type in right here. Now I'm ready to write something in a main function, right? Uh, but I really don't feel like typing all that much. So what I'm going to do is to use Another new feature that we just shipped, uh, code snippets, which was is available in Visual Studio um, as well, but we just added it here. Now I can select main. It's going to give you, me give me the main body uh, of the function, so I can start typing right here. So for this demo, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm thinking, I'm just going to do um, some math calculation, something really simple. Uh, takes in two inputs, two numbers from users, and then generate the, all the prime numbers in between. Okay, so I'm going to do enter two numbers. And you see the IntelliSense I'm getting as I type. And I'm going to do two variables and taking those values. As you see, I have no error checking whatsoever, but I'm just trying to get something running real quick. All right, at this point, how about let's do a class that will basically be a calculate class that perform one of the methods it's going to be performing, um, generating the prime numbers. So since I'm um, tight on time, I'm going to use another code snippets. Uh, we have a couple of snippets for classes. Uh, there's one for with inline constructor, destructor. There's also one for class template. So I'm going to use this one and rename this to calculator and I don't care about anything else at this moment I'm just going to add um, function card prime generator which takes in two integers and be done with that and now let's go define 
this method. You see the IntelliSense I'm getting here as I type in. Um, it tells me this is the one I can need to define, and I'm going to pass in x and y. Oops. See how hard it is to type on stage. Um, OK, so now I'm going to do a for loop real quick. Um, again, I'm going to use a snippet for a simple for loop. I'm going to do int. And this one is going to be y. And I'm going to go back and do this one as x. Really, really simple. Um, now I'm going to need a nested for loop in here. And I'm going to just cheat a little bit. You don't think I'm actually going to type everything on stage, right? Do you? <laughs> All right. Uh, just do that real quick. Um, so I found some code that can work, but it's badly form, uh, formatted. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and select and right click and say format this selection. So it's going to do the auto formatting uh, for my code. So we do ship with a clamp format tool. That's what we're using for this feature here. Is it configurable? Uh, configurable, yes. In um, what what settings do you want to configure? Uh, where to put so code style, where to put the braces. Where to yes. Put the so we have we do have that uh, in the settings. You can change that. Um, we pick a default. I think it's the Visual Studio style, but you can change it to something else. All right. So another snippet to do if, and I think we are pretty close to being done here. And I'm going to do code, which is going to be just output i value. And that's it. And coming back to main, I'm just going to instantiate this calculator with C and call that function with x and y. And now let's get, um, just so we have uh, the command line stop, so we can see what's being output. All right. I feel like we're done here. Any thoughts on running this? See if this will just work on first try. The which part? Below. Oh, below. We'll test it out. All right, let's see. Um, so now I have got my um, code written. The next thing I want to do is to compile my code. Um, so everything is driven by uh, tab, the task system in VS Code for building, for running any external tasks. So what we're going to do is go to Tasks menu. It has a Run Build Task. So if you do that for the first time, you're going to have a selection that says um, you need to config the task because we have not set it up <coughs> from a template. Um, so there are a couple of templates that um, the VS Code ships with, but we're going to go ahead and do the <coughs> others. And this is very, very straightforward. All I have to do here, it's a JSON file, um, give a name. The task needs a name. And you can then pass in any command you want VS Code to run as part of the build task. So on this machine, I have uh, GCC installed, which is the compiler I'm going to use. So one thing to mention is VS Code does not ship with any C++ compilers. It's up to you to select which compiler you want to you use. Um, it's, but it also means it's really flexible, because you can, you can call any, com, uh, any compiler from here. So for example, I can do G++, and I'm passing dash G just, to, just so we have the symbols generated, because I'm going to do debugging afterwards. Uh, but then that's basically it. Then CPP and output is going to be a hello world file. Save that. Uh, one more thing I want to do, it's optional, but I usually do that, is to just to make sure this is my default build task, because I can have multiple build tasks. And if you want something default, that means you can simply run that from here, run build task. So it knows this is the default one to call. All right, let's run that. All right, so VS Code comes with an integrated terminal, which then um, shows us the output. Uh, this is calling the command I asked it to call and returned an, a warning. Um, so th this is 
one warning here, which is not too bad, but if I got tons of warnings here, it's going to be really difficult to read. So for that purpose, we're going to enable another thing in the tasks, which is what we call um, problem matcher. Uh, it's nothing but regex definitions to um, tell VS Code how to interpret the return returned warnings from the compiler. So we have one built in for GCC. That's what we're going to use. Uh, we're going to kick off this again. Same thing, but one thing you will notice is over here in the problems window, now we are seeing the warnings coming back from the compiler. So you kind of have the UI integration here. What's nice about this is now you can double click on the error, which is going to take you back to the source code. Um, okay, so what is this one about? Control reaches the end of non-void function. Oh, because I defined it as an int and I didn't return it. I guess for here I don't really need an int, just do a void. And in a second you're going to see IntelliSense kicking um, to tell me that there's a squiggle here uh, that says my declaration is incompatible with the definition because I have different return types. <coughs> Of course, I need to fix it in here as well. All right, let's save that and run. Can you jump from definition to declaration right away? Um, no. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I said that too early. Um, so we have. I was going to show you that later, but um, we do have navigation features for to take you to definition or declaration, right? But what you could do is when you are in the definition file, which is usually CPP, you can do uh, switch to the header, the corresponding header file, which okay. basically does kind of what but you if want. If the cursor stands on the definition uh, signature, you cannot jump to the definition. Level. No, that's not something we have built in support for, but you can kind of work around that with the switch header and source, kind of. Um, yes? And how do you to know in real time if you have errors? Does it uh, run just your build or how? Uh, sorry, what? Can you repeat that? Uh, how editor knows that you have a different uh, declaration and definition without manually running build command? How does inter so like the interesting squiggle? How are we able to? Yeah. to figure out its, its mismatch. Yeah. Um, IntelliSense Engine uh, would index your code in the background. Um, so in this case, even though we haven't configured anything, IntelliSense actually is doing work in the background. I'll show you how it works once I'm done with this. Uh, but it is a real compiler-based IntelliSense Engine, which um, reads your code and has the understanding of your declaration definition, and that, that's how we did uh, the the navigation features. Okay, uh, okay. So we rebuilt, and the problem goes away. So we are happy. Uh, at this point, I already have my um, executable here, and I can simply use the integrated terminal in VS Code to run my app. All right. So right here, and I'll do hello. Enter two numbers. Two and a hundred. Uh oh. Other than two and three, the others don't look like prime numbers at all. All right. Let's see how we can debug this. Um, so coming back to my code, I wanted to be able to look into how uh, this prime generator function was called and and why it didn't generate the right numbers. So I want to put a breakpoint here. Now we're going to do debugging. So debugging in VS Code is um, in this debu debug tab, as you would expect. Uh, click on that button. It's going to start debugging. But then, of course, this is the first time we're running this. Um, it needs just need a little bit of configuration. So in here, I have the option of Node.js and C++, because Node.js is something that uh, VS Code supports out of the box. C++ is the option that we bring in uh, from the extension. Um, so on different platforms, we, def we support multiple debuggers. Um, on Mac, we have LDB integration. Um, if you're on Linux or Windows, you can use the GDB debugger. 
Um, and on Windows, you have the additional option to use the Visual Studio Debugger. It's all fully integrated here. And just need a tiny bit configuration. OK, another JSON file. Uh, it may look overwhelming at first, but really the only thing you need to do in here is to tell VS Code what program you want it to run, to launch. Um, for here, I'm just going to pass in the name of my program. That's all. Uh, workspace folder is, is going to be referring to the root folder I open in Visual Studio Code. In this case, it, there's only one folder. So, OK. Let me save that and switch over to the file. Now I can start debugging. <coughs> now Visual Studio Code is going to launch the debugger, load the symbols, and then launch my app in a separate terminal window. Why not a different terminal? That's an excellent question. Um, the question is, why not debug in the integrated terminal window? Um, we have heard that a lot as requests. Um, and that's something on the backlog we're going to work on uh, in the future. Two and 100. So we're hitting the breakpoint here, back in Visual Studio Code. Um, now you can look at your variable values by hovering over. Yes, another question. Can we open the debugger configuration file again? Uh, yes. Where is the, oh, LLDB. Yes. Um, the reason I have this is because I'm on Mac. So it, it goes and provides me the template for LDB by default. Um, like but here. Compiling with G++, why don't you use GDB debugger? I could. Um, Does it matter? I haven't tried that. Okay. But I don't see why it wouldn't. You should be able to. It just yeah. depends on what kind. So like if you're using Clang, it outputs uh, certain debug information that you might not be able to use automatically with LLDB. So we're just making a, a guess based on uh, your operating system here. Right. So for Mac, Mac, yeah, good. Probably LLDB. Um, as a default options, that was, that was all. OK. Uh, let's see where I was at. OK, here. Or you can look at the variable values in the locals window. Um, I can now step into the function. If I do that, oh, I was going to do step into, and then I click on the run button, of course. Um, but you get the idea. Um, let's try again. Because I really want to see what's in that function. All right, now we can step over. Um, of course, now the value of i is 2, and it was correct because it would output fine, just fine. And next loop, i is 3, <coughs> and that was fine too. But the, the question is the next one, which is i equals 4, which is clearly not a prime number. And oh, it skipped that if statement, which means we are not setting the value to false, which is why it got um, output. OK, so looks like I'm doing something wrong in here, in the if statement. Let's try this. If it's, if it's 0, that means it's definitely not the prime number. OK, let me save that. Um, so at this point, we just need to compile, recompile the code, and rerun it and see if it works, right? Um, one thing I often do is, at this point, I'm just going to hit a 5 and assume everything will just work. But that's how, not how it works in VS Code, because VS Code in the launch file, we all, we, all we said was launch this program. It would, it would not recompile. So what I always do, um, if you're kind of doing this development in VS Code, is to say, hey, before you launch my program, can you run this task? Um, all I have to do is to say, run my build task, and I'll be done with that. Now every time I hit F5, right here, oh, let me remove the breakpoint. I don't need it anymore. It's going to recompile, see, the execute, executing task <coughs> there, and I don't ever have to worry about not being um, compiled, actually. And 100. Yay, now we're get, getting our prime numbers. All right, very simple uh, program just to show you what the experience looks like when you're writing code in uh, VS Code. Um, OK, so I'm feeling pretty good about the 
program, would you say? Can we ship that? I know it doesn't have any error handling or corner cases or any, anything like that, but I'm feeling good about shipping. Um, how about let's add a license to the code? MIT sounds good? Sounds good? This is my favorite part of the feature we shipped this week. It's a code snippet for MIT license. That's all I need to do, see? Even has placeholder for year and name. Perfect for what I need now. All right. <coughs> um, so that's code snippets. And last thing I want to show you is uh, the Git integration. So now I have my code under a license. I'm going to share it with someone else on GitHub or something, and other people are going to contribute. We better have this under a source control system. And the VS Code has that built in. Um, all you have to do is to come here. This is the Git, Git tab and initialize the repository and pointing to this folder, which is fine. It's going to list every single folder, uh, every single file in that folder. Um, what do we want to have under source control? Source code and probably the JSON files so other people can use it. Um, so what's nice about having this in VS Code control is now if I make a change in the code, VS Code is going to detect that and tells me this file has been modified. Now if I click on this file, it's going to bring in uh, the side-by-side -side view to show me what has been changed. So everything you can, from writing, building, debugging, uh, source control, everything that you can do in VS Code without having to leave the editor. All right, so I think I'm done with this one. 20 minutes, exact. But I have to mind us all the questions you guys asked. But still, yes? Have you tried cross debugging? Cross debugging, what do you mean? Oh, sorry. Uh, the question is, have you tried cross debugging? Can uh, you clarify that? I have a device connected to my PC. And there is a it's constrained resources, and it has it's running GDB server, mm -hmm. and on my PC, GDB debugger connects to that GDB server and do this bug. If I want to do the same within this IDE, is it achievable? Yes, I believe so. Um, I haven't tried that myself, but I have a coworker who is focusing on embedded uh, development. Uh, he was telling me that was doable. Uh, we probably should do better documentations around how how you can achieve that, but I believe that is doable. Um, so we can follow up offline, and I can get you connected and, and figure out how exactly to do that. I don't have that set up right here. <coughs> All right, so that was my first 20-minute challenge demo. Um, so now we have seen how it works with a very, very simple program. Let's try something more complex um, to see if it works with real-world real apps. Um, let me close this folder, and I'm going to open something, another different uh, project. So what I have here, <coughs> Box2D, um, I can show that real quick. I got the source code from GitHub. It, it is a 2D physics engine for games, um, has C++ code in it, and I simply just download, clone the repo, and open the folder. Um, um, yes, code. yes, you could do that as well, because um, since we have the Git integration. So, yeah, I should mention, probably mention that you can directly run Git commands in here in the integrated terminal uh, to get the source code downloaded. I don't have the machine connected to the internet, so I can't no, do that right now. Integrated like in the Visual Studio extension. In the Visual Studio. Yeah, there's an interface port column and everything else. Right, um, so there are some Git, in, uh, Git commands that have UIs in VS Code 4, like push, sync, commit, stuff like that. But there are also commands that you, you just need to use the command line directly. There are also uh, more extensions for Visual Studio Code that should be fine to control over how you use Git. Right. Uh, is it the Git Lens? <coughs> Git Lens is a very popular yeah. one. I'm not exactly sure of its feature list, but it is by the <coughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's let's take a look at this project. Um, let's open some folders. So it has 
bunch of folders and subfolders and um, contain CPP and header files. It's a pretty well-organized, self-contained project, meaning everything it needs uh, is within the, the root folder. It doesn't have any external dependencies. So let's see what the experience is going to look like if I just randomly open a, a file in VS Code. No configurations has done so far, right? I simply just open the folder. And one thing you will see here is for a complex project like this, you still get IntelliSense out of the box with no configurations. Um, by IntelliSense, I mean multiple features. So first of all, you can hover over any functions to see what we call a quick info tooltip to show you the, the definition. Um, we do uh, what we call uh, reference highlighting. So if you click on a symbol, it's going to highlight all the occurrences of that symbol in that file. <coughs> if you start typing, let's see, uh, you kind of have seen that already in the first demo, but this one is going to show me all, all the methods I can use. Um, the clone, if I do parentheses, we show you what, the, what type of the parameters you should put in here. And if I just close it with nothing, IntelliSense is going to rest squiggle that and tell me, hey, you have too few arguments in this call. Um, so I get IntelliSense support all around. Um, other things you, we support is what we call code navigations. So a lot of times you, when you look at projects that you didn't work on or you look at someone else uh, code, you want to understand how code works. So you want to be able to see the definition or declaration of functions and stuff like that. So you could simply right click and uh, use one of these things. Go to definition, peak definition, we could do, let's say peak. Uh, the difference between peak and go to is instead of opening a file separately, this is gonna bring that file into the context of your current file in an embedded window. <coughs> so you don't have to leave the context of your current file. Um, so that's that, that's the peak definition. Uh, other things you could do is like you could just hold the command key on that um, so it becomes a link. You can simply click on that, which does the same thing, takes you to the definition. Um, we could also look for symbols or files uh, in VS Code. Let's say circle A is a B2 circle shape, and we know that we can simply uh, highlight that and do command T on Mac. It's going to search, what this is doing is it's searching throughout the entire workspace for all the symbols available in that workspace. So now I got um, everywhere B2 sh circle shape is showing up. I can click on that. This is the header file um, and simply do switch header source. It's going to take you to the corresponding CPP file, just like that. All right, so that's some of the IntelliSense uh, features you get out of the box. Um, I'm going to show, explain a little bit um, how that works behind the scene uh, once I'm done with the other parts of the demo. So we'll come back to this. But I want to show you how you can build a project like this, like go beyond a, a single CPP file. How do you build and debug in, in VS Code? <coughs> So very similarly to what we have done in, in, uh, in the previous demo is we're going to go configure task. I only have one. Uh, very familiar, similar to what we had. And the only difference is instead of calling the compiler directly in the command, I'm calling, I'm using a um, script file, which is basically here. And it is really, really straightforward. This project is set up to build with Xcode on Mac. Um, what I do in here is to say, just go into the build folder and use the Xcode command line tool to build this Xcode project. That is all. Um, and you can simply ask VS to run the build task. It is going to call, oh, yes, one failed because I changed the code without actually finishing it. Um, if I do that, it's going to succeed. But um, you get the idea. It's going to call the Xcode command line tool and build my project in here. OK, so using, by using the task system, you can pretty much do anything in VS Code without having to leave the editor. 
Um, now let's do some debugging, very, very similar to what we did before. You can set a breakpoint in here and go to debug. And let me show you the, the configuration real quick. Um, really not that different from what we did before. Uh, just tell VS Code where your program is. In this particular case, it's, it's built in the, under the debug folder. Um, and also you could specify the current working directory, which is what this project needs. So that's the only two things I did in this configuration, and I'm good to go. Let's go launch this app. Okay. So this is a Box2D uh, test application. It has a bunch of shapes on the screen, and it's meant to test the collision between different shapes. So what we have set the breakpoint for is inside this collide circles function, which means when two circles collide with, with each other, this breakpoint is going to be hit. So let's try that. I have two circles on the screen. Drag one and make that go and hit. And we're back in Visual Studio Code. Um, very similar, you could do variables, but one thing I want to point out here is you can also do complex expression evaluation here. As two example I have shown here, um, as well as multi-threading support. So out of the box, we do have multi-threading support for uh, in the debugger. So in here I have thread one, but if you have multiple threads, you can view that too. Yes, question. Visualizers. Uh, the question is, do we have visualizers? No, we don't have built-in like uh, NatViz supporting Visual yes. Studio, right? You are talking about. No, we don't have so that yet. You yeah, can, go ahead. You can technically put in NatViz files yourself. Uh, however, we uh, we integrate into uh, visualizations for GDB, LLDB, because all we're doing is we're creating a, a pipe between the two. So just like if you were using those things by the command line. Just presented in a very nice user interface. All right. Um, yeah, multi threading support is there. Um, in addition, you could also, yes, yeah, a question here. Sorry, I, I, really like, um, I really like to see you peeking into a, a standard container and see how it unfolds. Can, can you just debug down a few lines? You got some vectors oh, there, I guess, you know. or some sort of vector. Is that? Hang on, I'm going to have to rerun this. And collide. Okay. Um, step over. What do you want to see? I don't know what that like, is. Uh, I assume that's like some a sort P2. Of that you can use. Yeah, it's probably actually a real vector. No, that's this one doesn't have. Yeah. No, yeah, <laughs> this doesn't have what you want to see. Yeah. But it's, it's basically whatever you would see on the command line, right? So it, just because there's this thin layer that uh, goes back and forth. So if you can configure uh, this, you know, pretty printing for GDB, there's no reason why you can't do it for Visual Studio Code, basically. So uh, yeah, again, out of the box, it just depends on how you set up your build system and whether you made certain uh, symbols available to your debugger. Okay. Can you do some commands to a debugger in the, in the command line interface? Um, show the step trace in the. In the in the command line interface to the debugger. Um, so if, let me try to understand your question. So you're saying, can you run uh, command, command line, line to commands to the debugger yeah. in the command line interface? Um, so what you could do is, um, there are a couple of uh, GDB uh, commands we do support in here. So I tried the LDB example, it didn't quite work, um, but like for one example for GDB debugger would be if you run this, say you want to see the information in the registers, um, that's going to show you all the data in there. It's like an uh, assembly view that people have been asking for. So that would be one thing you could do, uh, a, a debugger command you can run here. Does the BT command work, that trace? It shows the step trace? Um, the step trace is on the code. Right, so yeah. The call stack would show, oops, what did I open? Dictionary. So only, oh, because only, I have that selected. Only the command that IDE supports can be entered in the command line to the debugger. Not any commands that the debugger itself supports. 
Um, actually, I believe it's the the, the commands that debugger supports. Yeah, you're, you're that everything. About GDB right there. In, in terms so of, can you yeah. can you enter the command bt? Bt. You want to try that? Uh, um, um, I'm thinking. Oops. I haven't used a BT uh, well, myself. Create, create a variable name for right, but I'm thinking you need something to tell the command line tool that you are calling a debugger command. Like we need to pref prefix this with dash xc in this example. Can you show how it works? Um, I don't have GDB debugger set up on this machine, um, but maybe on but, but this the Windows machine. Using some other debugger underneath, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's not the process isn't attached to that. Oh, oh, there it goes. Yeah, uh, so you need to prefix be... with that. Oh, okay, I think that's the that's the uh, catch. So um, so when breakpoint is hit, you can do stuff like that to passing debugger command directly. Um, but yeah. of course, use with care. Um, all right. Uh, yes. One more thing I want to mention in the debugging experience here is we actually do support conditional breakpoint. And you can do logging as well. So you can pass in uh, expression and tell it to break only when that is true. All right, now that's this demo. Let, now let's talk about how what we do behind the scene to enable IntelliSense. Um, here's the real magic that we do, which is. Um, if I do a command shift P, that's that is gonna just show me all the commands I can do. Um, do edit configurations. So by default, if you're happy with all the default default experience you're getting for IntelliSense, you don't need to touch this file manually. But if you do want to change some values in here, this is what you need to do: is to bring up this file. Um, by default, it's not created, but it's the same information we use in the background by IntelliSense. Um, OK, a couple of things we do. One is this setting here that says compiler path. So what we do is we auto detect the compilers installed on your system um, in those common locations. So for example, in here, it's slash user being clear. Um, what we use it for is we then query this compiler for the system includes and defines. That's how we resolve your system headers, because we know where they are. Um, so that's what we do for system headers. If you want to use a different compiler for some reason, you have different compilers installed on the machine, and you want to use a different one than the default one, you can change it here. Okay. So that's one thing. Second thing we do is how we resolve headers in your workspace folder. Like I have headers in subdirectories in many different locations. How do we solve that? Um, so this is one of the new features we just enabled this week, which is the star star syntax. <coughs> uh, meaning if you put star star at the end of any path, we're going to search your path recursively for anything available in your path. That's how we are able to solve all the all the header files in this particular case because it's self-contained. It doesn't have external dependencies. Um, that's how you can get the full IntelliSense experience out of the box with no configuration. Yes, question? So with a single star, it will only be searching the files in this current directory without recursive penetration into the opposite. Correct. If you want to opt out recursive, just don't put stars. If you want it recursive, put two stars. Um, so in, your, in, the, in the version that we shipped today, you might get slightly different experience because we didn't turn this on by default. So if you open a folder and you want it to perform recursive search, you want to come here and add star star. But in the future, we're going to turn this on by default so you don't ever have to touch this file. Um, so that's two things, which is how we provide intelligence for this particular project. Um, but you may ask, what if my project has external dependencies, external libraries I use? Um, which brings us to the next demo I'm going to show. So you may notice there's something other than the workspace folder path in here uh, that where we search by default. Um, this is the 
the VC package path. Anyone has heard of VC package or have used it? One, okay. Um, so VC package is a C++ package manager that runs cross-platform. Um, it is in here actually on GitHub as well. Um, itself is open sourced and um, it already has over 350 libraries, third-party open source libraries um, being supported already. Uh, it provides a really easy way to acquire those third-party libraries. Um, and I'm gonna show you that real quick in a different demo. Okay, let me close this one. Uh, close the folder and this demo. Um, this demo is really, really a simple um, application. So it has only one CPP file. What it does is it tries to render a triangle on the screen. But for that, it uses uh, the S SDL2 library. Right? So it's a sim simple application that has a dependency on third-party open source library. Um, now you can see out of the box, if we open that, kind of project in VS Code, we are not gonna be able to find it because you have something external to your workspace folder and we don't know where to locate those headers. Um, so this will be the default you will get if we are unable to find some of the headers <coughs> is we would green squiggle those headers we are unable to locate. Um, this, you can read the message basically that says we cannot find SDL2 SDL.h file and you get a message box that says, hey, you can update your settings to make full use of IntelliSense. Now, in this particular case, uh, the only dependency I have is on SDL2. And how, what's the best way to get SDL2 on my box? What I did was using um, VC package. Let me show you that real quick. So in this, in this blog post, um, basically we pretty much just announced the availability of this uh, multiple platforms like two weeks ago. Um, and what you do is you clone the repo, the source code itself, uh, bootstrap by running the script, um, build VC package itself. Once you're done, simply run this command, VC package install SDL2. And it is available, um, like I said, over 350 libraries are available today, including many of the boost libraries and other li yes question uh, what's the process of, you know, for getting the new library in there um so the question is what's the process for getting new library in there um that's a really good question um if you come here to our uh github repo um there's a documentation detailing uh detailing uh how you can do that the process um i don't have the network connected, so I can't do that for you. But if you go back uh, and search for VC package on GitHub, you can find it and you can figure out how to contribute and we would love more comp contribution. Um, okay, so that's what I did for SDL2. And there's one more thing um, to do in to, for VS Code to take advantage of VC package, which is to run this command, VC package install, integrate install, basically make VC package visible to VS Code so it knows where it's installed. That is all. Um, but of course, you wonder why we still have squiggles. That's because I tricked the system by hiding it. Um, let's do that. So by default, VC package goes to your uh, user folder, VC package and installed, and I have the OSX version. Um, you can see we have include folder, we have lib folder. We'll talk about lib later, but let's take a look at include folder. Um, I tricked the system by renamed it. That, if I rename it back, now VS Code knows I have this library installed in this location. So it can use that to resolve our missing headers. Let me just come back and I'm just gonna reopen the folder uh, file real quick, just make sure everything is kicked off correctly. Now the squiggles are gone because we are able to find the includes installed by um, VC package. Now I mentioned uh, it not only comes with headers, but also comes with lib files, which means you can use um, the installation for building your app as well. 
Now, if you're using CMake, like how this project's set up, um, you need to run this command. Basically, make VC, uh, call this uh, VC package .cmake definition, and that is all you have to do. And at this point, you can simply just run CMake and dot not load cache. I don't know why. <laughs> um, it's interesting. Hmm, I have not seen that. Uh, maybe I have to rerun this thing. Anyway. Um, Are you in the build directory? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I forgot. Yes, that's already built. Um, now I can run this from the command line. SDL demo. And we have our triangle using SDL2, the library I got on, on my machine. All right. Um, so we talked about IntelliSense, how we resolve system headers, your user headers, and third-party third libraries. And there's one more thing we haven't covered yet which is now we know how to deal with a single, single project. I finally have everything set up. Now I'm going to move on to a different project on my machine. Do I have to repeat the same process again? And we get that a lot, is how do we share the settings across different projects? Um, so in the latest version, we added support for global intelligence settings. And let me show you what we meant. Um, let me close this folder, and I'm going to open a different one. This is going to be in here. Another game engine uh, called Atomic Game Engine, I downloaded it from GitHub. It has a huge source base. You can go here, lots of subfolders. Let's say, at this point, I am only interested in a subdirectory. That's all I work on for now, right? Instead of opening the whole thing, I just want to open a subfolder in there. So let's do that. Atomic 2D. And if I open a file, oh, not surprised. Lots of green squiggles because it has references to um, header files lives outside of this particular folder, but it's in the parent folder of that folder. So now what I'm going to do is instead of re trying to re resolve this now, I'm going to add another folder to the workspace. Um, so if you haven't seen this, in, haven't tried this in VS Code, it now supports opening multiple folders in the same instance. So if you work on multiple things that belong to different folders, you can do that as well. Add another folder. I'm going to do app. How about app? And now I have a workspace that has two folders. If I open this file here, of course, this one has squiggles as well. Now I'm going to try to resolve both at the same time by defining uh, intelligence settings as workspace settings. So one thing VS Code has is it exposes many of the settings that you can change here. So if you go to Code Preferences and Settings, it has three different levels of settings you can set. User setting basically means it's a global setting that applies everywhere on your system per user. Uh, workspace setting would apply to everything in this workspace. And folder setting, of course, is per folder. So you have different levels. Yes, question? Uh, where do you find the possible settings that you can use? How do you, uh, the question is, how do you find the possible settings to use? Yeah. We have IntelliSense. See, intelligence everywhere. Um, so if I come down here to workspace and I do quote, and if you are in, only interested in C++, that's everything you can do um, with the auto complete uh, suggestion. So just to save the time, I'm just going to do a quick copy paste um, to adding the setting I need. You can also use the search bar uh, up at the top, which will look through that file on the left. Yeah, there's a search. Yeah, that's a good point. There's also search. You can type in and find and what's there. Very easy to set. Uh, you can actually take a look at the left pane, and then there should be a pencil icon which pops up, which will automatically populate your own settings. Yeah. Um, 
Although this search setting here is gonna only find you settings you already have in this file, but these are additional <coughs> settings that we don't populate by default. So by doing telescence, you can kind of see what you could add. Um, okay, so if we take a look at the setting I just added, really, really simple. Um, it says default include path, and I added the default, which is recursive search of my everything in my folder, of course, as that's step one, but also search everything under this um, folder. That would have everything I need um, to resolve the headers for those two project uh, folders. Yes, question? What's the workspace root if you choose to unrelate folders? Uh... Um, so the question is, what's the workspace root if you choose different folders? Um, so workspace root refers to um, here, like the workspace level. And different folder is referred to as workspace folder. It's a different variable. So it's basically a logical entity. It's not a physical entity. Uh, so the question is, it's a logical entity, not a physical entity. What do you mean by that? Well, Atomic 2D and Atomic App are actual folders. Right. I'm working from the, but right. works is root refers to uh, a higher level. Yeah, it's a logical folders. concept that groups these folders together. And you can save uh, workspaces on your disk. So next time you open, you can just open that workspace. It has everything in it already. OK, um, so. Would it be relative to that workspace file that you saved then with like um, so the question is what you're talking about, the workspace file that uh, I save? The dollar sign workspace <laughs> root. What does it resolve that, to? Yeah. Right, so that would be um, your the, the workspace you save in here. Yeah, but we haven't saved one yet. Yes, yeah, so we haven't saved one. Um, right now it's referring to the this one, even though it doesn't have a name. Um, there's a There's a temporary version of that that's being referred to. But once you save that, you can save that anywhere on your disk. OK, so if you tried and to use it, it would just be weird or something. Like we, it wouldn't work yet, because we haven't saved the workspace. And then after we save the workspace file, it would be relative to the workspace file that we saved, I assume. Um, uh, let, me, let me think through. So you're saying, because we, we haven't saved the workspace, we can't quite use this variable yeah, is it, yet. Is it unentitled quote in strings like or star 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 star? Um, garbage, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I should clarify. This is not referring to the name of the workspace, so it's not going to be resolved as entitled. This is referring to right now. It's the the a concept that's a virtual concept in here. Um, if you look at workspace folder, that's going to refer to this folder in here. Yes, but but you, you you're expanding the string right there in that file and it's, I don't know. Anyway, it's uh, if I understand correctly, workspace root slash atomic two D will always be the atomic two D folder. So right. Atomic app, app workspace <coughs> slash atomic app will always be the atomic app. Yeah, it's no matter where you put the file on the. Yeah, go so ahead. Wrong. You should be able to save the workspace <coughs> as a file. Yeah, um, yes. Right. And then so that will then exist on the disk. And then right. uh, basically Visual Studio Code will read that in and know to set up this particular workspace with the folders and the settings. Right. But his question is, what before happens? we save it, oh, exactly. where does right. it go? I haven't tried that. Because like, I don't know, it can look at both the directories and go, hey, wow, this is the common root. I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. It can do magic for all I know. Yeah. Right. But it could just pick the first one. Yeah. It could do it based on atomic 2D, because that's the first one. Um, yeah, so so to I think to clarify the situation, I think the the use of workspace root here is a little like we don't know where it's gonna resolve to. Yeah, yeah. But to be more accurate, I, we what we could do is for each folder, make sure you search recursively everything in this folder. Like this is a setting is gonna be applied to each individual folder when we actually resolve that. Would that. So that then expands into two paths as opposed to one, even though you only have one we, there. Right. 
<laughs> right. Well, well, this is so this. Yeah. This is the place to, to ask those types of questions, though, right? I mean, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so this is called. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me try to explain. So this is called workspace setting, meaning it's a setting that's going to apply to every single folder in the workspace. It's not a workspace level setting. So we actually take that, apply to each individual folder. So I think a better use of this here actually would be workspace folder. And that's like explicit about yeah. everything in this folder, search for that. Plus this additional thing you search for. So There's no workspace root that we need to resolve. Times, right. And therefore you'll get more. Right. All right. That makes sense. So, so wrong. one more thing. Yeah. If you hover over one of those, it's like workspace root, does it display any documentation relevant to it? Um, if I have over where? Yeah. Where? Okay. No, not no. Right. Let's work forward. So, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Now, let's go back. I'm going to just reload the window just to make sure IntelliSense is kicked off. Now, you're going to see this flame icon uh, we use to indicate the state of the IntelliSense. Um, when, it's, when it's going, <laughs> meaning we are still trying to resolve everything. But when it's gone, that means IntelliSense is done resolving the headers. Now you see in this, fo in this file, all the green squiggles are gone because we are able to locate all these headers. And if we switch over, and this is on fire, and it's going to take a second to finish. And done. And no green squiggles. And what's nice about this global setting, what we call global, but right now it's workspace level setting, is now we can add more folders to this workspace. And those will get resolved um, using the same settings. So that settings is going to be applied to this <coughs> third folder. And out of the box, no, no more configurations other than the fire is going to run for a little bit. And we're going to see the green squiggles go away. And that's really nice because I have just do it once and apply everywhere in my workspace. If you want it to be global, just define the same thing in user setting. It's going to go everywhere. Like if you have a common SDK or library, and you can put it in the setting um, there. OK. All right, let's see. What else do I have here? OK, now I'm going to switch back to Windows. Question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, how how, how uh, the number of files depend on uh, the time for IntelliSense to uh, process or headers, to find those headers? Um, so the question is how, how <coughs> much time it takes for IntelliSense to find all the headers? Uh, how does that depend on the number of files? So for example, if you have uh, project with like uh, 100,000 files. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't have those numbers like off the top of my head. Um, but also, this also depends on not only the number of files, but also oh. how they are structured as well. So we have to go um, deep into the, to the directories as well. So you're talking about recursive, right? Recursive search, because it, if it's individual, it's more predictable. But if it's recursive, we don't really know how deep, how many folders are there. And it could take a long time if it was large, especially if there are um, ambiguously named headers, like same, same name, but different locations. That would be, uh, that's something you want to avoid by telling us the exact path, like put that forward. Uh, up front, so we resolve those first and make sure we get the right version. Um, so in the future, we might do more ID, um, UI integration to let you kind of, if we find multiple ones and let you pick which one you is the right one you want to use. But right now, uh, help us by by having that path up front. That would help us. Yes, you have another question. Does it use the same intelligence engine as Visual Studio? So the question is, does it use the same intelligence engine as Visual Studio? And the answer is yes. Um, then on large projects, it will take a while to parse everything. And eventually, you will need to clean the cache because it becomes too slow. Um, yeah, performance is definitely something um, that 
could could potentially be a problem for large projects. Um, by the way. So that's why we have the the recursive uh, syntax as an opting thing. So you can decide wisely <laughs> where to use it, and then help us by putting uh, the known locations up front. But yes, uh, you well, have another comment. At least the original, the latest version of Visual Studio, I'm now using the IntelliSense server or Visual Sync. I use just the OPS version. Okay. Um, it's performing well enough to be a software. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So Visual Studio, the 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 support we had before is MS Build uh, projects, um, build system based. Um, this is more like an open, what we call open folder scenario, which means it doesn't have a build system. Uh, it has very little knowledge about how your project is going to be built, right? It basically has no knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. So IntelliSense would need uh, to find those information uh, separately. That's also something Visual Studio is adding to um, 2017 support. Yes, another comment? Uh, I have a project with a set of make files uh, with uh, auto tools, auto -con. Does Visual Studio code support auto tools? Um, so the question is, does Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, code support all the tools? Uh, I'm not very familiar with those tools. Are there any, anything special other than like running a command, they, external command? Yeah, it, it, the, the idea you can automatically launch certain file, which will generate the make files. Oh, I see. On the configuration. Okay, so you need to run those tools to generate your make files and then run like with C. the make files. It's like C, isn't it? Uh, I'm not familiar with C. So, so using uh, the so cast.json, you should be able to configure command line tasks. Therefore, if you can do it via the command line, there's no reason why you yeah. can't do it from within Visual Studio Code. Yeah, it's, it's basically you just tell it what to do. The commands have it in a batch file or script file and let VS Code run that, yeah. basically. So, so by extension, it should be uh, supported. And if the command generates new files, do you <laughs> pop up in the folder? Yes. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, the question is if uh, for the generated files, do they get populated automatically in VS Code? And the answer is yes. All right, so for the next demo, I don't know what time is it. Okay, um, I'm going to switch over to, v to Windows. And the reason I want to show you on Windows is because I want to show you the support we just added for WSL, which is Windows subsystem for Linux. Here on Windows box, I have basically the Ubuntu um, bash window running. So if you are targeting Win uh, Linux, um, this is, will be an option for you to still work on a Windows box, but have a Linux environment to work with. Um, so, yes, question? No, no, this is a subsystem of, of Windows. This comes with Windows. This uh, does not use VM technologies. This actually goes down to the, to the bare metal. It's a real um, Linux system without UI. So you have a command line. Yes, you have to say something. So, uh, just to, so there isn't any sort of abstraction layer. It's not like you're running some kind of mm -hmm. virtual Yeah, no virtualization. Like in <laughs> so you can actually just uh, turn on a, a, a developer setting and then literally download uh, their, like, what? There's Fedora or Ubuntu and one other distro of Linux, mm -hmm. and you can actually uh, just run it and get started within about you know, half an hour or yeah, or less. I always say less. Yeah, or less. less. Um, so it's a, it's a feature that's part of Windows. If you go to Windows features, you can find that in the list and simply enable that feature. And this one I have downloaded. This is actually from Microsoft Store uh, called Ubuntu something. Um, but then downloaded, it's like a run, running an app. But then you have a Linux environment to work with. Um, so I have got go ahead and uh, install GCC on this Linux system. So I'm going to show you how VS Code works with that system. Visual Studio Code, um, very similar UI on Windows. Um, what I have here is a very simple program. But the interesting thing is this one, uh, this app right now is targeting WSL with me doing nothing, no configurations, because we auto detect that um, I have a GCC compiler installed for my WSL system. Um, 
I can prove that to you by going to go to definition. So let's just look at what version of IO stream file it's gonna it's gonna use, right? So let me open this file, reveal in Explorer. Okay, so this is the version of that header, uh, which is basically the version in the WSL system mapped back to Windows file system. That's why you see this this long path here. Um, this is mapping to my Ubuntu system on Windows, but then this is basically your uh, Linux path to that. Um, so on Windows, <coughs> Visual Studio Code uh, does a few things. We try to find a compiler, right? Like we, what we saw on Mac, we detect the client compiler on Mac. On Windows, because there are so many different subsystems, and we want to support that. Um, so our logic goes like this. We look for Visual Studio as the first option. If you have MSVC installed, we're going to use that. Um, on my box, I currently don't have VS installed. That's why WSL is up as the second option that's picked. Um, and then we will follow uh, if you do, didn't have WSL enabled or didn't have a compiler installed, we'll move on and say, hey, it seems like you have a MinGW installation, and we'll use that. If not, then we we'll try to detect SIGWIN as another option. And if we go through everything and nothing found, then you just have to do manual configuration. But by default, it should uh, work pretty well with out the box with these subsystems. <coughs> yeah, like question. If I start a project, like I have, let's say I have nothing installed, and mm -hmm. then I start a project, and then mm -hmm. I install Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. Will it will the project then suddenly pick up that hey I have found the compiler now? Um, depends on when whether you have already opened it in VS Code. You have never opened it, then it's fine. It's gonna detect on your first open. But if you have opened it, we probably had gone through that logic already. Um, you might wanna um, to kind of clean the clean the um, what the file we already generated and kind of reload it and and uh, have it redo this thing. And that's actually available via the command palette. So you just right. have to hit a hotkey and say, hey, I want to regenerate this, and it'll give you a completely new configuration yeah. to work with. Um, yeah, just simply delete the, <coughs> the file they have and regenerate. Um, so for the sake of time, uh, I want to finish my demo here. So I just showed you how WSL is detected by default. Um, the second thing I want to show you is, let's go ahead and open. Oh open this configuration file that we are very familiar with at this moment. Um, so this is a default. Um, I'm going to show you this is a compiler we found on WSL. So I can go ahead and rename this configuration to be WSL, just so it's clear. Uh, what I want to show is how you can add multiple configurations. If you target more than one system, I don't know, it could be the same project you have for Mac, Windows, or Linux, or it could be a subsystem that you're targeting WSL or MinGW. Um, you can easily add another <coughs> configuration by doing this. So now, if I do this, and comma, and copy over, and name this MinGW. Of course, now I'm going to have to manually pass in the command, because it's a different location. So on my system, I have MinGW installed right here. MinGW, Bing, and then I have a compiler here, right? So that's the path I'm going to copy and paste in there, which is right here. I'm going to do a quick copy-paste uh, here. And you see how we accept Windows-style path and Linux-style path, and we do them automatic mapping because of the different subsystems. But you need to do the double, double, double backslash. Uh, yes, you do. Okay, so now we have two configurations. Uh, it's super easy to switch between configurations. Come here, um, that says WSL. Now I have two different ones. Now I can simply switch over to MinGW. See we're on fire again because IntelliSense kick, gets kicked off and say, hey, now I want to resolve everything in the context of MinGW instead. Now, once it is done, I can prove to you now we are targeting MinGW indeed by going to this file 
and open it in Explorer. This is using the MinGW version of that header file. So we can switch over between different systems really, really easy. OK, um, so that's that demo. Uh, one more thing I'll show you. Um, something about VS Code itself is now we have seen all these features in VS Code. And the question is, what else do you want in VS Code that would whatever tool you're using today uh, to at least give this a try and uh, what's stopping you from doing that? So one thing we hear um, pretty often is I'm used to some other tools, key map, like key bindings. And I'm used to that workflow. And how do I do that in VS Code? And I have to learn all these new things and stuff like that. Um, so to help with that, we actually have a number of extensions, uh, oh, which is right here, to help you map the, the key bindings from other editors. We have a big list of things from many different editors. Um, so let me show you that real quick. So I have the Vim one, the Vim key map installed in here. Right now it's disabled. That's because once I enable it, it's going to take over uh, on my keyboard. And I, I'm not really a Vim user, so I can't really work with that. <laughs> um, but now I have it in, enabled. Uh, we, it's completely in, we are completely in Vim mode at this moment. So what do I do? So I do um, H, H forward and go up line, J, K, J, K, uh, W for moving forward by words. Um, and then I can do O to start a new line and start typing. Um, yeah, stuff like that. You're completely in a, in a Vim mode at this point. And uh, we have key map for other editors if you come from other background. Um, so I just want to show you that. Uh, and of course, VS Code is really, really fully customizable, as I mentioned. Um, I think I'm done with the demos. I can stand up now. Yes, question. Uh, I have one question about um, key mappings. And yeah. I think this was an, an asked for feature in it. Um, um, keyboard macros, uh, being able to, um, I don't know, I, you know, start a macro, type a bunch of, like open up a bunch of menus, do a bunch of commands, and then re reproduce them over and over again. Um, is that supported now? <coughs> Um, so the question is if whether um, keyboard macros is supported. I don't know. Okay. Do you know, Griffin? Um, I know that there is an interface for accessing the <coughs> key bindings manually, so you don't necessarily have to download a package to change uh, the way most of this works. Um, I would have to do some research. I would imagine that there would be some way to configure how your task.json works. So just by uh, mapping some key bindings to a specific task, that's kind of at least get you most of the way there. I don't know about uh, text editing specifically, yeah, it's but. More about like. Uh, working within the editor or? Yeah, like when you want to reproduce some pattern of keystrokes over and over again. Oh, I see. We usually do this in Vim. OK. Yes, like those kind of Yeah, things. so hmm. that's, that's not officially. So that would be more so the Visual Studio Code side of things. So Rong and I, we yeah. work on the C++ extension. I see. But we're happy to take that that feedback to yeah, the team. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, because we, we, we try to make sure to get back to people's feature requests as quickly as possible. We're always answering the, the GitHub issues and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I, I like your guys' editor. It's a very good version of Sublime. Um, OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, a compliment I take. I <laughs> OK. I, yeah. I use Sublime quite a bit, too, but it doesn't have keyboard macros either. Right? OK, Same. all right. So I end up back in Vim all the time. OK. <laughs> <coughs> is that the only yeah, thing? Yeah, sorry, yeah. is that the only thing that's missing? Otherwise, you would be um, in VS Code all the time. Configuration is quite difficult at my work. I'm not quite sure. We use Visual Studio there, and okay. I probably continue to do so. Okay. I know that we do actually have people working on. Mm, uh, I think it's about 12 million lines <laughs> of code, and we do use Visual Studio Code on it. Okay, uh, good. It seems to work okay, but 
I haven't been doing that full time. I've only used that small toy yeah. project. I see. Before. Got it. What okay. What I would say is uh, just consider. So if you're working on Windows, there's no reason why you can't do your text editing in Visual Studio Code and then do your actual debugging and heavy lake uh, work inside of Visual uh, Studio. Which is yeah. 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 You have the. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if you have any kind of uh, like refactoring support or macro expansion, you know, which uh, helps with uh, evolving the code base, and discovering the code base, understanding the code base, all that feature. Yeah. We just do have a lot of these. Mm -hmm. We still need a lot more for C++. Yes. Um, so the question is whether we have support for refactoring, macro expansion, and features like that, like what Visual we, we Studio has. Um, so the answer is we don't have those right now. Um, as you can see, we are still like kind of finishing up the the core feature set, uh, but that's uh, definitely something we have heard over and over, especially refactoring. Um, yeah, that's all I can say for now. It's on the backlog, it's something we have heard. Yes? If VS Code is available for free, then what does it give to Microsoft? Why did Microsoft decide to develop it? <laughs> so the question is, since VS Code is completely free, what is Microsoft getting out of this? Excellent question. What, what's the business case? What's the yeah. business case? <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we started the project, the thought was really simple. Was we realized there are a lot of developers working on non-Windows systems, and we only had Visual Studio as an offering on Windows. So we never, yeah. we are never able to reach to these developers. We are nev never able to have a conversation with these developers because they are not part of our ecosystem. So our first thinking when we started the project was really about how can we, how can we start a conversation with those developers? Like how do we understand what they are trying to do? Uh, how do we help them there? Uh, so that's how I started as a cross-platform editor. Um, and also because Visual Studio, how we position it is like a fully, fully featured IDE. It has everything, all the features. Um, but we know developers, there are developers who prefer editors over IDEs because some people like lightweight tools, some people like heavy IDEs, which is all fine. So we want to provide both options. Um, <clears throat> as far as business models go, Visual Studio is free as well. To some extent, we made uh, the community edition free to small companies, students, hobbyists, and stuff like that. Um, and we really just want to have our, have developers in our ecosystem. I think that was, that was the initial thought, is once we have a connection, we have a conversation, we understand what you're doing, and there are things we could help. Um, and then maybe we'll figure out something later. And we don't really actually make money off VS Code at this moment, as you can tell. It's completely free and open sourced. Um, but yeah, was, uh, the basic thinking was just to reach out to the developers and build our developer base and have a conversation with more customers in our ecosystem. That was the idea. So if I may... I yeah, go ahead. So Microsoft... Uh, <coughs> Over the last few years, we've definitely been uh, transitioning over to being able to offer services for the, the developers that we form relationships with. Well, as it turns out, Developer Tools is a fantastic way to form relationships with developers, say that they uh, need some tools to be made for their particular application. We can have talks with them, and in doing so, we can talk about some of the other services that we offer. So it's, it's more so like a win-win for all of the people who are involved. Okay, so in summary, uh, the Studio Code makes a great C++ development environment by leveraging everything VS Code has to offer, plus uh, the intelligence and debugging and all these features we offer through the extension. Um, so one more thing I want to mention um, <coughs> about <coughs> Linux development. Um, I didn't have that slide until last night. Um, that's based on the conversations I've had in the past couple of days is, if, um, if, if I'm developing for Linux, is then an option for me to continue to use Visual Studio? And there is. Uh, with Visual Studio 2017, you can remote target Linux for C++ development. You get full IntelliSense, you get full debugging, it's the full power of Visual Studio IDE you can use for Linux development. 
Um, so it goes into more details on the slide. Um, the way it works is very, very similar to Visual Studio Code. Like it doesn't uh, require like a build system. You can use CMake. We have out of box for CMake. You can bring in your own compiler. And you need a little bit of configuration, like the JSON files we went through. Very, very similar. Uh, but once you have that set up, you can connect to a remote Linux box. You get IntelliSense. You can full debugging using the Visual Studio debugger. So just as another option, if you're targeting Linux, yes. So I have a question directly. Connect, uh, connected directly to that. A, the connecting dialog is very hard to find in the middle of the settings dialog. Okay. Somewhere hidden. Okay. That's a hard to find. It okay. Be somewhere more visible. That's a minor gripe. The other, my major issue right now is that uh, our system uses a gateway server to connect to the target machines, and this cannot go through that. So I simply cannot. Uh, what was the, the sorry? What was the issue? Our connection. It's not a direct connection to the target. Machine, oh, okay. But go through a gateway server, which and then it needs to execute some commands. Oh, I see. Transfer to the target. Mm. So, is there any hope that we have support for that in the future? When do you you don't have a connect, direct connection? Mm. Yeah, we we'll have to think about it. Um, yeah. So the question was two things. One was the connection dialog was kind of hard to discover. Uh, the second comment was uh, the remote machine doesn't have direct connection with their development box and uh, whether that could be supported. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to think about how we can support that kind of scenarios. Okay, you had the comment? No? No? Okay. Uh, actually, I have a Oh, comment. you do? Someone asked for remote debugging in Visual Studio Code. Yeah. Uh, in case yeah. you need to, I have it. I figured it out. So. Yes, we do have remote debugging yeah. for in Visual Studio Code. Yeah, it just requires you to configure the launch. Instead of running an application, you have to set it to attach to an application or to a port and so on. Yeah, there are some intricacies to doing that with Linux. It's I actually, so I work on the C++ extension for Visual Studio Code, and I use Visual Studio Code more to do that, so I'm actually debugging the extension <laughs> using Visual Studio Code. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I do have a little bit of experience with that. So basically, if I were to try to debug the C++ extension, I would open up a window of Visual Studio Code uh, that has the newly built binary running. And then for my other instance of Visual Studio Code, I then attach to that process, and I can actually see what's going on. <laughs> yes. That is supported. Yes, yes. go ahead. Uh, one thing I find a bit uh, cumbersome is adding all the include parts manually. Uh -huh. While usually I have CMake projects that already know where yes. all the includes are. So yes. Um, so the question is um, adding all the include paths for IntelliSense is a bit hard and too much work. And yeah. you're, you already have CMake uh, in there. Why can't we use that? I was wondering why nobody asked that question. Because I added that in my slide last night. <laughs> um, is CMake support. So um, things we already, are, are, we already talked about, I just kind of summarized there for um, watching afterwards. Um, but right now, in our extension, we don't have IntelliSense support out of the box for CMake. What we do have is the last bullet point there to support uh, compile commands or JSON file, which is a file you can export using CMake. So as part of your CMake build process, just passing additional flag. Uh, as it builds, it, it will generate additional file. That's this name. Um, so that's all we need for IntelliSense. So in the setting file I showed you in there, uh, which is this guy over here. And you can simply just passing, let's see. Oh, I'm in Vim mode. Go. <laughs> Tell me how to, how, how to work that with that. Um, I'm just not used to that. Uh, OK, that's file. And then just go here and say uh, use compile commands. That's a property you need. Uh, what you do is pass the full path to that file, and we will use that for IntelliSense. So that's the kind of the, the approach for the time being. But CMake support is definitely something on the radar. Is it possible for an extension to modify the include parts of the C++ IntelliSense? Because that way the CMake extension that exists is quite nice. 
Uh-huh. We've actually populated the file correctly, but I don't know if that's allowed or not. Uh, yeah, um, so the question is, can the extension modify the setting file for IntelliS for the include path, right? I believe that's what the extension does, the, the okay. CMake tools extension. Basically overrides our JSON file. Oh, um, it. Yeah, it does work that way. Um, so that's another option for the time being, is you, if you want to use CMake. Yes? If you go back to your, or back to your IDE, I saw something oh. down there about Azure, Azure. Yes. So maybe there is a, a monetization thing in there for what, what sort of cloud services are, are at least maybe supported or something for this? Uh, so the question is what kind of cloud services is supported in VS Code. Um, so VS Code itself doesn't do, it doesn't provide any of those things. What it does is like this extension here uh, called Azure Storage. Uh, what you do is once you have your Azure account signed in here, it has a connection and read information from your storage account back into the IDE and tells you, hey, these are the, I don't know, what tables, the queues you have in storage. So as a, as a way to view what you have in the cloud. Uh, but there are many other extensions that would enable different Azure services. Uh, for example, there's a Docker extension. So if, if you want to build a Docker image, uh, that extension allows to you to view the, image, the Docker images you have built and upload it. So stuff like that. So right now, it's it's basically UI to view what you have mm -hmm. in the cloud. Um, we are looking at different ways for how we can help developers to kind of, if you have a cloud need, like push things into the cloud, how we expose those commands through UI. So that type of thing. Um, OK, so we are almost running out of time. But I have something important I want to show you. Let's go through all that. And the call to action, install VS Code and the ex extension if you haven't already. But this is what I want to show you, is 2018, this year, is our 25th anniversary of Visual C++. And uh, it's pretty cool if you look back in the history, uh, what Visual Studio versions we have shipped over the years, all the way back to 1993. This is when Visual C++ 1.0 launched. And I actually have a video there. Okay, there you go. Full-featured, really professional C++ Windows application in minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Visual C++. Um, so that was Dennis Gilbert, and I believe he was the dev manager on the team back then. And he announced the launch of Visual C++ 1.0. So 25 years later, we find the t-shirt design, that the t-shirt he was wearing, the purple one. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, we reprinted a bunch of the t-shirts, and I brought over some to Aspen and have them in my suitcase. So feel free to grab one after the session. I should have enough for everyone in this room, and you may able, be able to get to choose the right size as well, because I different <laughs> different sizes. Um, Anyway, so, whoops. <laughs> no, I don't need to listen to that again. Um, I, I know we are out of time. Um, happy to take any other questions afterwards if you have any, but thank can, you so. Can you show the link to start exploring? Oh, oh, the tool? Oh, yeah, yes. So read it on the screen? Yes. Um, also, here. as a heads up, we are partly open source. So if you want to contribute, you can just find us on GitHub at MS Code. Uh, what, what is it? VS Code CVP tool. Yeah, it's the last one. Uh, yeah, github.com, Microsoft, VS Code, slash, uh, dash, CVP tools. Every single day, basically. All right. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, feel free to grab a t shirt. <laughs>